So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of what uh, we talk about, Lauren Klein and I talk about in our book, Data Feminism, which is basically a book that's an extended answer to this question, what does feminist data science look like? Um, and the, the too long didn't read uh, kind of takeaway from this talk um, is basically this. Um, so it's just really, it's not enough. Like if what we're after is really transformative social justice, like we really are serious about equity and equality for all genders. Um, it's not enough to just have disaggregated sex and gender data. It's not enough to document sex and gender based differences. Uh, we actually have to look at disaggregating patriarchy, white supremacy, and other forces of oppression as they show up in our data, as they show up in our algorithms, as they show up in our data systems, but also in our processes, our assumptions, our values, and our institutions. Um, so these are, these are systemic things that show up everywhere. Um, um, and so this is work that comes uh, out of a collaboration with Lauren Klein. Um, she herself has a very long and wonderful bio, and I would just encourage everyone there to go look up her work. She's doing this amazing work at the intersection of digi digital humanities, uh, literary studies, and historical research. Um, and so she runs a lab at Emory called the Digital Humanities Lab. Um, uh, so in data feminism, we really see uh, this as a growing body of work, um, a lot of which is actually represented at the seminar, um, but it's work that is looking to try to hold corporate and government actors accountable for basically making sexist, racist, and classist data products. Um, and so I think these are the things that have probably come up a lot, but um, these are things like face detection systems that can't see women of color, hiring algorithms that demote women's resumes, uh, child abuse detection algorithms that punish poor parents and more. Um, and as we were writing the book, we were very inspired by um, a lot of the work that you see here. Um, and what, what, what happens is these examples of these very deeply flawed systems keep coming um, and they keep getting sort of, you know, part of the reason we wrote the book is they kept getting reported on with this like shock of like, oh my God, how is it that like a database can be racist or, you know, an algorithm can be sexist? Um, and we wanted to bring um, a kind of more of a root cause analysis um, to what's going on, because if you are coming from a body of knowledge that theorizes power, and that could be feminism, but it could also equally be critical race studies. It could also be queer theory. It could also be indigenous or ethnic studies. Um, you know, there's a kind of a root cause analysis here of what's actually happening, and you would know that this is the way that the system operates, and it's entirely predictable that we would end up with algorithms and data systems that discriminate on the basis of these identity characteristics around who is subordinated in our society. Um, uh, and so, you know, the way that we talk about this is, you know, in many ways in our world today, data is power. And, you know, we mean that in like a super literal way too, in just like who are the companies that have the most resources and money right now? They are the ones who are able to uh, collect, store, aggregate, maintain, deploy, um, and ultimately use data as a way of extracting profit, uh, right? Um, so in many ways, data is power. But um, this, in fact, uh, is where feminism enters in because in many ways, feminism is also about power. Um, so feminism and intersectional feminism in particular have been focused on imbalances of power as well as the structural forces that cause them for a very long time. Um, and what we like to do is be a little bit specific. Um, there are actually many feminisms. Uh, I don't agree with all of them. Lauren doesn't agree with all of them. Um, and so we like to be specific about what we mean by our feminisms. Um, and so for us, um, we start with these three things. So first of all, feminism is at its root a kind of a belief in equality and equal rights for all genders. 
Um, and so this is like a kind of like the core starting premise. Um, but if you look around you, uh, you can look at anything, <laughs> literally anything that's in the news right now. <laughs> and you can see that this goal of equality has not yet been realized in the world. Um, and so feminism also entails uh, organized activity, political action, activism on behalf of women and non-binary people and gender minorities uh, to make this goal of equality the reality. So it's like the status quo is like not working. Um, and then thirdly, and I think really excitingly um, and importantly for all of us, um, although this may be super basic for folks there, um, is um, feminism is um, a intellectual heritage, meaning we inherit a set of ideas and theories um, that are in some cases, you know, hundreds of years old, um, but at the very least, you know, 40 or 50 years old. Um, and these are theories and ideas that begin by thinking through issues of inequality with respect to sex and gender differences. Um, and yet the past 40 years of scholarship in particular have brought many more dimensions of inequality into the conversation, uh, including race, class, sexuality, ability, and many more things. Um, and so that brings us to this idea of intersectional feminism. Again, not sure completely, this is probably not new, this has probably come up already a lot today, um, but the, you know, the core premise here is that intersectional feminism is really not only about women, um, it's not even only uh, about looking at gendered inequalities, um, but it's about power. It's about who has power um, and who is uh, subordinated to power. Um, and these ideas of intersectional feminism come to us from uh, work of women of color feminists and black feminists in particular. Um, so there's folks like the Kambahi River Collective, um, who's from Boston, where, where I'm located, um, who had this idea of interlocking systems of oppression, meaning um, we cannot only be looking at gender differences when race is a huge part of how somebody is subordinated. Um, same idea with Kimberly Crenshaw's term intersectionality, which is a very spatial metaphor to say like, here's the system of patriarchy, here's the system of white supremacy. And when you sit at that intersection, your experiences are fundamentally different than people who are only on sort of like one of those um, roads or paths. Um, and then finally, Lauren and I in the book rely a lot on Patricia Hill Collins' idea of the matrix of domination, um, which is a kind of taxonomy of ways to think about how oppression and subordination are organized. Um, and so let's see, that's what I want to say here. Um, yeah, so like the, basically the idea here is that we really need to foreground these conversations about power and also foreground conversations that look at sex and gender in relation to these other systems of power, these other, um, you know, what, you know, I've recently been writing a little bit about how uh, gender and race are themselves technologies of classification. They are systems of classification that are imposed on us. And I think uh, Meredith's talk did a great job of, of sort of showing us how those systems are imposed on bodies and those bodies don't always fit into those systems. So we can't think about sex and gender as some kind of like natural, essentialized uh, property that a body carries around in this kind of like object-oriented ontology, right? Um, but in fact, it's a systemic thing that is, that is imposed. And what that entails is that we need to also challenge um, such systemic uh, unequal systems in a systemic way. Um, okay, so, um, so where Lauren and I um, try to con contribute to this conversation um, is we did a scan and looked across a great deal of feminist literature, um, in particular literature that uh, was really trying to like operationalize feminism, to like do feminist design or to do feminist economics or to make feminist maps, um, things like this. I think about, well, like, how do we actually like embed these ideas? How do we bring an alternative epistemology uh, to the practices of um, data, design, data science, design of computational systems, and so on? Um, 
And we used a lot of those teachings to come up with these seven principles of data feminism. Um, this is, in fact, how the, the book is structured. So we have a chapter about each of these principles. And we try to, in each chapter, um, introduce folks to not only the feminist theory that led us to conceive that principle, but also to people who are working with data in the world who are actually sort of enacting or doing that principle. Um, and so in a short talk, obviously, there's not time to go through all of these, but maybe I'll just draw your attention to the idea that, um, again, there's a centrality of power here. So the, the first two chapters are about power, examining power. So it's kind of understanding how power is an operation. And that's what I mean by disaggregating patriarchy and white supremacy or ableism, kind of thinking about like, how are these systems in operation in our data sets and our data systems, because we have to understand that first in order to then be able to challenge them and to in fact use data on computation uh, to challenge them. Um, okay, I think that's all I'm gonna say. And then I just have a couple more minutes. Okay, I'm just gonna show a couple of examples of projects that we talk about in the book to give you an idea of um, some of the flavor of the projects that we discussed. Um, as I think this project may be familiar to folks, this was actually on the, the workshop's website, um, and, I, and I'm happy to see it traveling far and wide. Um, the project um, is called the Library of Missing Data Sets. Um, this is by the artist and educator Mimi Onuoha. Um, and this illustrates this idea of examining power. And so this is actually an art project. Um, and so it is actually this filing cabinet that you see here on the left. Um, and it's also a collection, a list of data sets, but there are data sets that are what Mimi calls missing data sets. Um, so data, these are data sets that are not being collected. Um, and so as you read over her list, you can see things like trans people killed or injured in instances of hate crime, people excluded from public housing because of criminal records, um, and so on. Um, and we can think of a lot of, um, certainly in the COVID pandemic, many um, ways that data have been missing or sparse or neglected or not made available. Um, and so the way that you encounter the artwork is actually so you go up to this like uh, white filing cabinet that you see here, um, you can go through this, the, the files, and each file is titled with the title of the data set that uh, is missing, the data that we don't collect. You can actually like take out the folder, you can open it up, but of course there's nothing inside the folder because the records are missing. There, there is no body that is collecting that data. Um, and the point that she's trying to make, and it's accompanied by a really beautiful essay that she's written, um, is that the data sets are missing for a reason. And the reason is this profound imbalance of power with respect to data collection in the world today. Um, and so this determines which data are collected, which are not, which research is conducted, which is not. Um, governments have this power, generally speaking. Moneyed institutions have this power. Uh, minoritized communities generally do not. Um, and so this is why a kind of feminist approach begins with this analysis of power. You know, often we're talking in, if we're talking about like algorithmic bias and things like this, we're talking about kind of the data that already exists and the ways that those are baking in these kind of um, systemic biases. Um, but in fact, the bias begins earlier upstream in the pipeline um, because there's also this bias in what we have chosen to prioritize as worthy of measurement and data collection and knowing about and what we have systematically um, disregarded or neglected, um, which is not a case that everything should be in a government database, just for the record. <laughs> but but there there is a kind of politics, of course, to what we choose to collect data about and what we choose to systematically ignore and not know about. Um, so the next about is um, coming out of this idea of challenging powers. This is the second chapter of the book. I'm thinking about ways that data and information can be used to challenge power. Um, and this, in fact, also has to do with this idea of missing data. Um, and it also has to do with the topic of feminicide. 
um, which for those who don't know, feminicides are gender-related killings of women and girls. Um, they include cis and trans women. They're um, legally defined. They're, they're a huge organizing, uh, momentum-driving public issue in Latin American countries right now. It's a, a really big topic right now in the Latin American feminist movement. Um, and thanks largely to the movement, um, laws have been passed in almost all Latin American countries. And so this example has to do in particular with Mexico. There actually is a law defining feminicide in Mexico. Um, the state nominally is supposed to be um, tracking and measuring the phenomenon and addressing it. However, um, the state does not do a good job of that. The state does not systematically collect data on feminicide, much less deliver any kind of justice. Um, and so this is the subject of emerging public anger in Latin America um, and in Mexico specifically. Um, and so back in 2016, a woman named Maria Salguero uh, resolved to sort of head straight towards this problem and start to collect this missing data herself. Um, and so she's done this for the past five years where she reads media reports. And um, now that she's been doing the work for so long, actually, she has she's a member of tons of WhatsApp channels. Um, she gets a ton of crowdsourced tips and reports that she verifies and um, tries to keep track of Mexico's very large territory. Um, and she spends around two to four hours a day doing this work in a volunteer capacity. This is like not her her like job um oh is the raised hand to mean i'm i should be finishing um you have two three minutes yeah okay okay thank you um and so in the book we talk about this as a form of data so this is the kind of a activist data collection that steps in when the state and other institutions have systematically and failed to ensure the basic safety and rights of their population. Um, and so this idea of counter data or even counter data science represents one way to use data to challenge power. In fact, we have a number of these examples of counter data science um, that we discuss in the book. And I'm going on to build on this work a little bit in my, my next project. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up here, but I'll just give you a quick preview of, of sort of some of the other things. Um, we talk a lot about process. Um, so thinking about participatory process for data science, um, there are many fields who've developed ways of collaborating with members of the public. Um, there's no reason why uh, computer science can't build such a capacity, uh, but it currently doesn't have that capacity. Um, we talk a lot about the principle of rethinking binaries and hierarchies. I think that's really well matched with uh, Meredith's presentation about uh, the gender binary. Um, gender binary is a kind of toxic classification technology that has been imposed on us and that we need to reject in all of the forms in which it shows up. Um, we talk about data communication because it's also important to think about that stage when we're, we're circulating data objects out into the world. Um, and think about how we can bring in emotion and embodiment um, and kind of more ways of, of knowing and feeling other than just uh, 2D minimalistic data visualizations. Um, and then maybe I'll just end on this final point is that data feminism and then I would say any approach to data science that's mo mobilizing a sort of counter hegemonic approach um, really requires an expanded definition of data science. Um, so. It's a data science that isn't defined by the size of the data set. Um, it's not also defined by the technical credentials of people undertaking the work. Uh, these are concerns that are continually used to exclude women and people of color from the field, um, as well as to exclude uh, work whose contribution is socio-technical rather than purely technical. Um, but when we expand, these amazing things happen when you expand your definition of what is data science and who is a data scientist, um, then you can see clearly that the most exciting work at this intersection of data science and justice is not happening. I mean, some computer scientists, yes, are doing this work, but um, some of the most exciting work is also happening with artists, with journalists, with community organizers, with librarians, with archivists. 
Um, and this work is happening in a kind of really different, different circumstances and um, different spaces. Um, so I think I will just end there and another 100 different ways to contact Martin and I am being done dialogue. So thank you so much.